It's a really great pleasure to be able to come to the Haven Center. Uh, I was actually invited here quite a long time ago and was unable to make it because I was pregnant with my first child and my doctor told me I couldn't fly. <laughs> so I had to cancel. Um, now she's 18. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really, really wonderful to be able to address this audience. Um, and before I start my, my PowerPoint, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what I'm going to be doing. I know the Haven Center is a very future-oriented um, uh, place for thinking about the way the world should be remade. Um, but the stuff I'm prepared to talk to you about, and which I've given for reading, is all in uh, the history of egalitarianism, and so I want to spend just a little bit of time explaining why I'm digging back into history uh, uh, rather than looking to the future. Um, the two public lectures uh, that I have prepared are actually using uh, the history of struggles over the abolition of slavery to work out and illustrate a pragmatist theory of moral change, both the change in moral consciousness, that is how we can improve our beliefs, uh, practically speaking, and change in moral practice, and how we can test and know that that change is progressive, is a positive improvement. Uh, so that's what my two lectures are going to be about. They're using history as a resource for thinking about how to construct uh, uh, moral change on a large scale, not just in an individual's head, but uh, on a social scale, and to confirm that uh, these changes are good, or at least test whether they are uh, positive changes. And then for my seminar, we'll be looking um, in more detail at some aspects in the history of egalitarianism, which is my uh, current project, and focusing primarily on some uh, aspects of pre-Marxist, pre-socialist, radical egalitarian thought uh, uh, to kind of think our way back uh, uh, to a time when things looked really, really different from the way they did today. And I hope that will also help us think about uh, the way forward. OK, so today we're going to be looking at a couple of case studies in uh, contention over slavery. And we'll start off with the figure of John Newton. Uh, who was a seaman and a captain in the slave trade. Uh, and on uh, one of his voyages, he experienced a conversion to Christianity uh, and felt that he was delivered from the power and dominion of sin upon uh, uh, being rescued from what he felt was a near-death experience. It's very common in seafaring tales at the time, uh, you know, the ship starts taking on enormous amounts of water and a storm, and they pray, if only God will save me, uh, you know, I will be pious forever after. And that's precisely what happened to him. So he felt delivered from the power and dominion of sin as he was transporting slaves across the Middle Passage. Uh, and indeed, in his memoirs, he said the slave trade was the best calling for promoting the life of God in the soul. Imagine that. Why? Because he, as a captain, he had hours and hours of solitude uh, where he could pray and study the Bible and live in his reverie with a personal relationship to God, even as his cargo was dying of disease in chains and shackles in a suffocating hold beneath. He said that he never knew sweeter or more frequent hours of divine communion on a voyage in which 19% of the slaves he was carrying across the ocean had died. 
1781, he eventually retired from the slave trade and he became a famous Anglican minister, best known for writing the beloved hymn, Amazing Grace. And in 1781, he delivered a sermon in which he condemned England for a long list of sins, including a large national debt and blasphemy, but he never mentioned the slave trade and slavery itself as among those sins. And in fact, it wasn't until 1788 that he was persuaded by abolitionists that, in fact, uh, his first career was gravely wrong. Uh, and at that point, he wrote Thoughts Upon the Slave Trade, in which he confesses embarrassment that he hadn't realized that what he had <coughs> done in those years in his first career was morally wrong. 30, so that's more than 30 years after leaving the slave trade. This had nothing whatsoever to do with his conversion to Christianity, which happened while he was still a captain. Uh, um, finally, it dawned on him that all those years as a slave trader, he had done something wrong. I think Newton's transformation of moral consciousness encapsulates in microcosm uh, a moral transformation that actually took place worldwide. If you look around 1700, <clears throat> across the world, there was a, by and large, a pro-slavery consensus. You could find isolated individuals who thought slavery was morally wrong, but uh, you didn't really find in 1700 whole societies condemning it as utterly unjust <coughs> and evil. By the mid-18th century, we see abolitionist movements beginning. Uh, abolition was achieved in the Americas first in 1794 in Saint-Domingue, the only successful slave revolt in the history of the world. Uh, and then a whole bunch of emancipations after that until the last one in the New World, 1888, took place in Brazil. Um, in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, by now we have a world anti-slavery consensus. Virtually all the nations in the world sign on to it, uh, the last being uh, Mauritania, which abolished slavery legally in 1981, uh, although I've heard that it's had to abolish it a couple more times again. It appears that abolishing slavery is harder than just passing some laws. So uh, I'm sure everyone here sees this transformation of moral consciousness and practice as a case of moral progress. Uh, but how can we know that that's true without begging the question in favor of our current moral beliefs? That's easy enough to do, but of course, you know, 300 years ago, <laughs> people begging the question in favor of their current moral beliefs would have come to a very different conclusion. So we have to ask, how can we possibly know that this is about a kind of moral progress? And I think we also would like to know how this took place and whether we can draw any general conclusions about how to achieve moral progress by looking at how the transformation of moral belief about slavery took place. Maybe we can draw some general lessons about how to improve our moral beliefs. Now here, I'm focusing on morality in a fairly narrow sense. We can think of ethics broadly as concerning any normative question whatsoever, but I'm only looking at morality in the sense of what we owe to each other, a sphere of obligations to other human beings. Um, and I'm also not interested in individual moral change. Uh, I'm interested in change in whole societies. How do whole societies change their minds, so to speak, about uh, uh, right and wrong, moral right and wrong? <clears throat> and the framework that I'm going to be using uh, to understand this transformation is pragmatism. Uh, I think John Dewey basically has the best account around of how to understand moral progress. And so in this lecture, the next one, I will explain in some detail about how pragmatism can actually be worked out as a moral theory. Um, Dewey's a very interesting character. I really recommend that you take a look at his introductory textbook, uh, 
in Ethics that he wrote with James Tufts, second edition, 1932. It's a remarkable work. Most ethics textbooks start with some exposition of maybe fundamental moral theories such as utilitarianism and Kantianism, or perhaps they might begin with some meta-ethical exploration about the nature of uh, claims of value and obligation, maybe with some linguistic exploration. But Dewey didn't start off that way at all. In, in his textbook with Tufts, he actually starts off with sociology. Uh, um, He's thinking, what do we need morality for anyways? What are moral norms doing for us? And he says, he's reflecting on some very general features of the human condition, one of which is our pervasive interdependence. All human societies depend on cooperation and coordination from other people in order to achieve the basic things that any society needs to reproduce itself. Uh, Growing enough food, defending itself against outside enemies, raising the kids, and so forth. Okay, and that pervasive need for interdependence uh, uh, leads people to create norms of cooperation and mutual assistance. So, essentially, what Dewey's doing is he's understanding norms, moral norms, that are actually practiced in society is a species of social norm. A moral norm that's actually accepted by society is basically held up and sustained by shared expectations of conditional conformity. That is, you know, I'll go along with this norm if you do, and we all kind of keep each other uh, uh, in line through these shared expectations. Uh, of conditional conformity. Now, moral norms also purport, they have a certain purport behind them, namely of an authoritative command. <coughs> right? You owe it to me uh, to behave in this way, to respect my rights, or to, to respect my property, or not to injure me, and I owe it to you in reciprocal fashion to respect your property, and so forth. Critical to Dewey's perspective is a distinction between the right and the good. So on Dewey's view, the good is something like an idealized desire of the individual, right? The good for me is whatever I desire, idealized in terms of, you know, I, I know the properties of the thing that I'm attracted to, had experience with it and things like that. That's the good, okay? It's a kind of idealized desire, and it tends to be rather, it can be idiosyncratic or self-centered in various ways. The right is entirely different, okay? The morally right is not something that the individual can intuit in herself or just by reflecting on her own desires or perhaps idealizing on them. Notions of the right, said Dewey, and here he was observing child development, they always come from the outside. How does a child discover the difference between right and wrong? Not because she's thought it up, the way she might discover, say, that a chocolate chip cookie is good. That's something maybe she could figure out on her own just by tasting it. No, a child discovers the distinction between right and wrong by, from the outside, from the experience of being held to account by someone who has authority over her, right? Usually a parent. She does something like messes around with some household object that breaks, and then, you know, her father or her mother will blame her and hold her to account. And suddenly she realizes that the content of the right, namely that she ought not to be breaking stuff that isn't hers. Uh, that is an idea that comes from the outside, from someone who has some authority to demand that she behave differently and pay attention to other people's interests. Another feature of Dewey's view, uh, which I think is uh, quite right, is that 
customary rules of morality are typically unreflected. You ask most people why they shouldn't do something like steal property or break a promise or lie, and I've had they don't, they're not ready to give you a very good answer because the reason why they adhere to a moral demand that's conventional in society is simply because everyone expects them to. It's ingrained in habit. It's not because they have reflected on a moral argument and rationally accepted. So how does moral change come about if, uh, if morality is actually practiced in human societies? It's just a matter of unreflective, habitual uh, uh, norms and mutual expectations. Um, <clears throat> Dewey said moral change happens primarily uh, through interpersonal conflict. Two people have opposing interests. Maybe they're fighting over who's entitled to a piece of property uh, uh, or whether somebody broke a contract or something. <coughs> Uh, and what was the content of that promise, and then they appeal to norms that are already existing in society in order to resolve their conflict. So one party might appeal to considerations of desert in order to justify their claim to some good, and another party might appeal to considerations of need in order to justify their claim, okay? And at that point right now, both of those norms are embedded in society. We have a conflict, and now we're jolted to try to reflection to try to figure out uh, how that norm applies. Alternatively, people might have rival interpretations of the same norm. <clears throat> so both people might agree on some common norm, such as the, the golden rule, but they disagree about how to apply it in the particular case. Sometimes uh, people might challenge the traditional rationale in favor of a norm because they want something contrary to that norm or at least how it's usually applied. Again, it's interpersonal conflict that's driving the need for reflection about morality. If it's not interpersonal conflict, the second way in which uh, uh, moral reflection could be created uh, or stimulated would be if people discover new consequences of the old norm that they've been practicing all along. Or maybe, they, maybe the con bad consequences have been there all along, but it's the first time they drew the causal connection between those bad consequences and the practices that they had. So an example would be they might accept a rule of property according to which property owners entitled to pump unlimited amounts of water from uh, uh, beneath their property. And uh, that's before they recognize that a practice of unlimited pumping will lead to uh, the wells drying out uh, if, it's a, if it's an arid area. Uh, and then, oh, they realize, OK, well, this can't go on. <laughs> We're going to have to change our, our, our rules, OK, because they discover that there's a bad consequence or a rule that maybe they had carried over from, uh, from when their ancestors lived in a rainy area. So in all these cases, what happens is society is confronted a situation in which there's uncertainty and disagreement about how to proceed because of conflict or because they realize that carrying on as before has bad consequences they haven't really thought of until now. And that leads then to moral reflection, OK? Well, what did we want this, why, why did we ever establish this norm in the first place? Okay, it's only at that point that we actually get any kind of reflectiveness on the point of the customary norm and maybe we'll want to revise it. So at that point, what we're looking for is methods of intelligent revision. Um, and this is really the key to all pragmatist theories of morality. Okay, the core idea of pragmatism is we're not going to be looking for a fundamental principle of morality that could be known and justified a priori 
and that such that once we grasp it, we'll figure out how to apply it to every, every conceivable problem that might pop up. Primates say, we can't get that. It's just a hopeless endeavor. Instead of looking for some fundamental principle of right, such as the categorical imperative, or the golden rule, or the principle of utility, instead of looking for some fundamental principle that could be applied in all possible worlds, we will instead look for methods of intelligent updating. Okay, so the idea is, okay, well, we're starting off already with a set of moral norms that have been habitually accepted in society, and now we see that they have problems, they're incapable of resolving certain interpersonal conflicts, or they have bad consequences we hadn't thought of before. So now we have to update our principles. We have to do this in an intelligent way. Okay, that's really the core idea be behind all pragmatist theories. And there's two best basic ways, I think, that we can intelligently update our moral beliefs. One works ex ante, okay? That is before we've actually instituted a new uh, moral principle by which to regulate our interactions. Ex ante, what we can think of is, well, why did we have this norm in the first place? And maybe the norm that we have encodes certain deep moral biases. In which case, to improve that norm, to improve our moral beliefs, uh, uh, we have to devise practices that can overcome or block the operation of systematic uh, uh, biases in our moral thinking. And I think about this on analogy with improvements in scientific methods. So we, have, we know that we are subject to various systematic cognitive biases in judging the relations between cause and effect. One is wishful thinking, pervasive bias. You know, a researcher really wants their theory to pan out. <laughs> they really want it to be true. This can have profound consequences if, say, we're testing whether or not a drug actually cures a disease. And so then we Scientists have devised methods to block the operation of this bias of wishful thinking. We institute double-blind, double placebo-controlled clinical trial. Okay, so nobody knows whether they're taking the drug or the placebo. The whole point of this is to counteract a cognitive bias that we know systematically infects our thinking about causation. And similarly, we could do the same thing for morality. If we have some notion of what kinds of moral biases we tend to be uh, uh, subject to, we can figure out ways to counteract those moral biases and the beliefs that pop out. We have reason to believe are better than the ones that we had previously. Not necessarily that they're true or that they're perfect. We have a reason to believe that moral beliefs that were formed under conditions in which we have blocked or counteracted certain known biases in moral thinking are likely to be better, okay? <clears throat> but we also have ex post methods for testing uh, 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 whether or not a new moral belief is actually better. And this is the experiment in living. So standard philosophical methodology relies very heavily on thought experiments, okay? You imagine, well, suppose we acted in accordance with this principle, you know, push the fat man in front of the trolley, kill one to save five, okay? Philosophers love thought experiments. They're trying to say, yeah, thought experiments can get us certain ways, but there are problems with thought experiments, too. Uh, we'd often learn something from real experiences. <laughs> Maybe uh, if we actually do an experiment, that is, we put a new moral principle in practice, or a conceived moral principle in practice, and we see whether uh, we can live with the results, whether the new moral practice solves the problems of coordination and cooperation that we wanted it to, uh, uh, and with acceptable 
side effects. Okay, that's kind of ex post testing. And my uh, second lecture is going to be focusing more on the experimental side. This lecture is going to be looking more on the ex ante side. So now we have to figure out, okay, what kinds of biases, moral biases, have to be checked. And uh, here's what Dewey and Tufts say in their ethics textbook, uh, identifying a very powerful moral bias that specifically affects those in power. Dewey, Dewey and Tufts say it's difficult for a person in a place of authoritative power to avoid supposing that what he wants is right, as long as he has power to enforce his demand. And even with the best will in the world, he's likely to be isolated from the real needs of others, and the perils of ignorance are added to those of selfishness. It's a really great passage, and I think we should unpack this, okay? Um, Dewey is saying that being in a position of power is likely to distort one's ideas about what, what moral obligations people have. Okay, and he's identifying more than one reason for that. One is, is that people in power tend to be ignorant of the interests of subordinates, of those beneath them in the social order. What do they care? They don't know anything about, <coughs> about what the uh, uh, subordinates need or want. Uh, uh, so they're not really in a position to know how their interests bear on what's morally required. Secondly, I think even more importantly, Dewey is pointing to the fact that the powerful tend to be insulated from the characteristic experiences that spur critical moral reflection. So think back on Dewey's story about how children learn to engage in moral reflection. Okay, The child goes to the park and he picks some flowers from the public garden. And the uh, parent says, you can't do that. You know, those, those, those flowers are for everyone to enjoy, not just for you. OK, that, that's an idea coming from the outside. The child's held to account, is blamed, shamed, right? made to feel responsible for this. Well, the powerful, though, when do they get those experiences? Uh, with respect to their treatment of their subordinates, hardly ever, <laughs> right? Who's going to hold them to account? They're the one who are, they're the ones who are making the rules. <laughs> they're the ones who are running the prisons, writing the laws, and so forth. They tend to be insulated from just those experiences which are needed to stir any kind of critical reflection on their own conduct, at least with respect to their conduct with respect to subordinates. And thirdly, being in a position of power tends to lead to arrogance. Powerful people tend to dismiss their subordinates as unworthy of a hearing. What do they have to listen to these people for? They're beneath contempt. And so Dewey thinks, well, OK, here we've identified some moral biases that disproportionately affect those in positions of power. We can see this actually as a generalization of the commonplace that everyone's biased in their own case. That's something I think that we widely recognize. The difference is, is that subordinates, although they might be biased in their own case, there's lots and lots of social uh, uh, institutions that are designed to jolt them into recognition of other, the demands that other people are making on them. Uh, uh, not so much with the powerful who've written the rules uh, uh, in their own interests. So Dewey thought we need corrective social practices, OK? Um, and they have to do three things for us in order to counteract these three moral biases. They need to inform the powerful of the interests of subordinates in a stirring way, in a way that's actually able to arouse their emotions, not just mere cognition. These corrective social practices need to confront the powerful with experiences that spur practical reflection regarding subordinates' claims. It's not enough just to sort of know in the abstract or intellectually uh, that, that one's own conduct in institutions is causing gratuitous suffering of other people. Uh, uh, this knowledge has to be 
mobilize in such a way as to jolt the powerful into practical reflection. And thirdly, in order to counteract arrogance, the arrogant dismissal of subordinates, uh, uh, people need to, the people making claims on the powerful have to display their worthiness uh, to show that they can't just be dismissed. They have to somehow find ways to put authority behind their own claims. And so this leads us, I think, directly uh, to the sphere of contentious politics. Um, and here's the link up to sociology. So we can find contention as any kind of claim making. You know, I make a demand on you, you make demands back on me. Okay, this is all mediated by a normative language. You ought to do this, you owe me that. Uh, I acknowledge that it's my duty to do something for you. Contentious politics is coordinated claim making by whole groups around some kind of shared agenda that addresses authorities. Okay? And we can think of contention as occupying a spectrum. On the mildest end, we just have pure moral argument. Okay, the kind of the stuff that uh, philosophers deal with around the seminar table, just pure moral argument. On the other side of the spectrum, we have violent action, sometimes contention is pressed by violent means, and then we have various points in the middle that represent an increasing disruption of routine. So closer to the argument poll, we have activities like petitions, writing op-eds in the newspaper, public debates, political theater, teach-ins, Somewhat more disruptive of routine, we have things like litigation, election campaigns where the contenders are trying to over, you know, overturn the government in power, you know, change the laws, lobbying to change the laws, demonstrations, things like that. Even more disruptive of routine, we have things like boycotts, picketing, strikes sit-ins and occupations. These are things that actually might make it impossible for many people to carry on as usual. Okay, their, their, their ordinary habits of life are interrupted. Uh, and then, uh, and then we have violence, things like vandalism, riots, and rebellion. Now, I stress that not all acts of violence amount to contention. Sometimes violence is just getting, getting what you want. You're not trying to make claims out of people. You're just kind of grabbing. Uh, but sometimes, in fact, violence is a way of making a claim, uh, making claims on others. So one question we can ask is, why do the claims have to disrupt routine in order to be effective in moral transformation? And I think this gets back to the fundamental point that moral norms, when they're actually realized by society, are sustained by shared expectations, not by individually accepted arguments. Very few people can wrestle up a decent argument in favor of the moral norms that they abide by. Uh, they abide by them out of habit uh, and the knowledge that other people expect them to behave that way and they expect uh, uh, others to behave that way. Um, the key thing about disruption of routine carrying out of uh, norms is that then it undermines those expectations that other people are going to conform and that other people expect oneself to conform. It disrupts habit and it's precisely those circumstances that lead people to practical reflection. In the absence of disruption, it's fine people can argue about rival moral norms around the seminar table, but that's not the same as practical reflection, which is oriented to action. It could be just in purely speculative mode. Uh, you know, we could wonder, well, suppose morality were like this. That's not the same as practical reflection, practical deliberation, which is oriented to action. Mass disruption is what we're talking about with contentious politics. Uh, and when lots and lots of people coordinate their contention in such a way to challenge 
uh, an established norm, uh, then it's quite possible the challenge norm can't perform its coordinating function anymore. Think of the mass sit-ins during the uh, uh, civil rights movement, for instance, to disrupt racial segregation uh, restaurants. Um, in addition, mass disruption also has symbolic purport. It's a lot of people getting together refusing to concede authority to those who are enforcing the norms. And that threatens the enforcers with a loss of honor, right? It, we're saying we withhold our recognition of your authority, okay? And that could be motivating, it can motivate deliberation, it can even motivate change. Um, so now I'm going to borrow uh, some thoughts from Charles Tilley, who defined the social movement as a mode of contentious politics, not the only way in which one might conduct <coughs> contentious politics, uh, but one very important way. He defined the social movement as a sustained campaign of claim making using repeated performances that advertise the claim based on organizations, networks, traditions, and solidarities that sustain those activities. So we're going to be looking at the social movement as a mode of contentious politics and exploring its epistemic powers, that is, whether it does actually have, social movements have the power, at least in tendency, to counteract the moral biases of the powerful and thereby to help us improve our moral beliefs. Okay? Now, turns out that the British abolitionists pretty much invented the social movement. Okay? All the stuff we know today about how to organize a social movement, the British abolitionists pretty much figured out. They invented the first logo ever. Uh, they invented the mass distribution of an iconic image illustrating their complaint. They, the, I'm sure you're familiar with this poster. Uh, this was printed and distributed en masse to demonstrate the cruelties of the slave trade. should point out that in Britain, abolitionism initially referred to the movement to abolish the slave trade. Uh, and, and the abolitionists moved on to abolish slavery a few decades later. Uh, but first they were just focused on the horrors of the slave trade, so they see, they show the slaves being packed like sardines uh, in a slave ship here. Uh, they organized a book tour uh, by Aluda Equiano, a huge success. Uh, his book sold out on, after multiple subscriptions and printings, and he was a major force for, number one, counteracting white racism by demonstrating uh, that uh, he was, in fact, a very talented, honorable, highly skilled individual, uh, uh, and also testifying to the evils of the slave trade and slavery. The abolitionists invented the first consumer boycott. They boycotted slave-grown sugar. Uh, Elizabeth Hayrick was uh, one of the great uh, organizers of uh, women's boycotting of sugar. Sugar, of course, was very integral to the uh, uh, to tea time. Put your tea in, uh, put sugar in your tea. And Hayrick was uh, one of the great uh, organizers, uh, organizing women to reject slave-grown sugar. And indeed, the mobilization of women and workers, who of course didn't have the vote at the time, was critical not just for the abolitionist movement, uh, but also for spurring larger scale movements uh, to expand the franchise and ultimately the feminist movement many other social movements that fell out of that. Abolitionists also uh, pressed litigation on a large scale. Uh, the famous case, Somerset v. Stewart, uh, uh, it, uh, in which uh, the slave Somerset complained about being uh, shipped uh, against his will uh, to a slave colony. Granville Sharp, an abolitionist, took up his case and argued that uh, it was against the laws of common law of England to uh, uh, 
ship a slave against his will overseas. And Lord Mansfield was sort of backed into a corner. He wasn't really keen on making uh, uh, a judgment. Uh, but he was forced to uh, declare that uh, the slave was correct. And his famous decision, Somerset decision, was widely interpreted in England uh, uh, to declare that slave that, that once a person touches England, uh, English territory, he is thereby made free. It's not exactly what Mansfield said, but a lot of people took him to have said that. Um, petitioning. Uh, the abolitionists uh, really turned mass petitioning uh, into a huge scale uh, kind of activity. This is just one petition from Manchester that collected 2,348 signatures in 1807. The scale of this was completely unprecedented in Britain at the time. In 1792 alone, the abolitionists collected 519 petitions against the slave trade, amounting to 390,000 signatures. That was one and a half times all the signatures on all petitions that had been submitted to Parliament between 1765 and 1784. We're talking about just huge scaling up of the effort. <coughs> Again, many of these signatures were of people who were not entitled to vote at the time. Lots of women, lots of working class people were mobilized against uh, uh, the slave trade. And then, of course, we had other abolitionists like Thomas Clarkson, who tirelessly traveled almost to the point of exhaustion. Clarkson himself traveled 10,000 miles just promoting the second phase of abolition after the slave trade was abolished. He traveled 10,000 miles against slavery itself and finally won passage of a bill along with his uh, uh, allies uh, uh, abolishing slavery uh, in 1833. It was a gradual abolition, but it did eventually happen. Uh, another feature of the social movement that's very critical is uh, the social movement needs to recruit insiders who have some power and authority, somebody like William Wilberforce, who's a member of parliament, but they also need outside radicals who are always pushing the envelope, <laughs> right? And people like Elizabeth Hayrick were on that side. So inside Parliament, people were talking about gradual abolition and dragging their feet. And Hayrick was out there publishing this very famous pamphlet that basically called for immediate abolition. None of this foot dragging. We have to do it now, immediately. And it's that kind of impatience of the radicals in the movement that forced the insiders to move perhaps at a quicker pace uh, uh, than they would be comfortable with. So now what I want to do is, these I think are fairly familiar features of social movements today, and now let's reflect on what their epistemic effects <coughs> are, their effect, their moral effects. Um, Charles Tilley characterizes social movements as all sharing four characteristics. Number one, the members of a social movement have to publicly display their worthiness. So they often recruit people who are already respectable in society, such as members of the clergy, or in an anti-war movement, they might recruit veterans. Um, they dress neatly and so forth, demonstrate their worthiness. Secondly, they have to show unity. They all have to be on the same page, right? If you have internal dissension uh, within the social movement, it tends to fall to pieces. And then, and then the people who are, whose views are being challenged, really, they don't have to pay attention anymore. Thirdly, they have to show numbers. It's very important to mobilize huge numbers of people, rally them behind the cause. This was the tremendous effect of mass petitioning. Parliament had never seen anything on that scale before, not remotely on that scale. And fourthly, uh, they have to show their commitment, that they're willing to sacrifice themselves for the cause. People like Thomas Clarkson, who traveled himself to exhaustion on behalf of the cause. So here are some descriptive features of social movements, but why should we think they have any kind of positive moral effect or uh, are liable to lead to positive moral change. Well, when members of a social movement display their worthiness, it's a way of shoring up their sense of moral authority and also to refute the charge that they're just insolent, insolent insubordinates. 
right? So they, they, they try to do stuff to demonstrate that they're respectable, okay, in order to shore up the sense that they're actually making moral claims and not just a crazy rabble. Unity is very important uh, because if the, if the movement has not come to any kind of consensus within itself about how things have to change, then outsiders will say, well, look, if you can't even agree among yourselves, why should we, you know, pay attention? Okay, so they have to rally around some focal point, what they want to achieve. They want to be unified. Mobilization of large numbers of people behind the cause exposes the rupture of expectations that shores up conformity with moral norms. Okay, it shows, hey, you know, a lot of people don't expect you to go along with slavery and all the laws that uphold slavery. It shows that large numbers of people reject that norm, uh, and maybe even to the point where ordinary life can't carry on as usual anymore, and it creates new expectations. Demonstrations of commitment, of willingness to sacrifice oneself for the cause is very important. It's a way of displaying moral seriousness, it, that the motivation of the people is really moral and not just covert self-interest, refutes uh, uh, the idea that there's really alter ulterior motives behind their action. And also demonstrations of commitment, self-sacrifice for a cause is a way to inspire awe. Most people aren't prepared to engage in a lot of self-sacrifice uh, uh, for something outside themselves. And awe is an emotion that's pretty close to a recognition of authority. And so it's a way to transition outsiders and make them see, oh, well, you know, maybe there is some moral force behind what these people are saying. And so for this reason, we can think of social movements as potentially, at any rate, engines of moral progress. Because we can see them as operating against the moral biases of the powerful. Social movements inform the powerful of subordinates' interests in a stirring way, just like the illustration in the slave ship Brooks. A lot of people in England were, you know, the slave trade's happening thousands of miles away. What do they know? You inform people, okay? This abolitionists went through massive fact-gathering, very detailed. They got testimony from sailors who had been involved in the slave trade who talked about how cruel it was. A lot of this was news to people. So, and they would testify in very stirring ways. <coughs> Equiano, too, testified in very stirring and personal ways. Uh, uh, okay, so you get information. <clears throat> Secondly, the social movement confronts the powerful with the characteristic experiences that stir practical reflection regarding subordinates' claims. And they do so by disrupting expectations and habits. Okay, you can't carry on as usual with hundreds of thousands of people rallying against you. And also by withholding normative recognition. Right here you had hundreds of thousands of ordinary people who were complaining that Parliament uh, uh, was upholding a system of horrible cruelty and injustice. Uh, uh, and now members of parliament who were upholding the slave system uh, were threatened with uh, loss of recognition, okay, uh, a loss of honor. The movement displays the worthiness of the claimants as a way of putting moral authority behind their claims and again forcing the powerful to sit up and take what they say seriously. So all these things, I think, illustrate some of the epistemic power of social movements. But from a pragmatist point of view, this epistemic power is completely contingent. It is not a general property of social movements as such. Uh, uh, the epistemic credentials of a social movement come from the fact that they counteract moral bias. If they're not doing that, then you don't really have any grounds for being confident. Uh, uh, in what they're demanding. And again, the analogy here that I like to draw is with placebo-controlled double-blind 
clinical trials. You identify some moral bias, it has to be corrected. <coughs> and if your methods of provoking moral change aren't doing that, then you don't necessarily have a good story about why you should believe that the change is progressive or represents an improvement. A neat way to encapsulate the ways in which a social movement would have a tendency to spur moral improvement is it will do so when it speaks truth to power. Not otherwise. Not every social movement is actually a movement from below addressing the powerful. And uh, not every social movement speaks the truth either. If it's not doing both of those things, there's no reason from a practice point of view to think that that social movement is liable to be, have a tendency to uh, uh, improve our moral beliefs if we take it seriously. Um, so the story I've told is a story of how contentious politics has epistemic power. Okay, and the importance from a pragmatist point of view is that this helps us understand we can link together some ideas from pragmatist philosophy with some ideas from sociological theories of social movements, see how we can make the world better. Um, now, I'm running out of time, and so I don't really, uh, I want to leave enough time for questions. So I think I'm going to skip over a second mode of contentious politics, but I'm happy to discuss this uh, uh, in Q&A, where I move over towards the violent <coughs> end and talk about how slaves engaged in contentious politics and some of the epistemic uh, uh, features of their modes of contention. But I'm going to skip over that now so we have enough time uh, for Q&A. But I just want to, uh, uh, let's see here, uh, have a final reflection on what do we mean by moral progress in the end? Uh, I started off with uh, the story of John Newton, and that makes us think, in a way, Newton even cast his own moral transformation as a kind of falling off the scales, right? Suddenly, now I see the moral truth. It seemed very sudden. Uh, and of course, he was attached to a model of moral <laughs> belief change that is like a religious conversion. I mean, that sort of was his model. Um, but in fact, if we actually look at the history of abolition, it didn't quite work that way. Um, both Newton and William Wilberforce, uh, who was the leader of the first phase of the abolitionist movement uh, for the abolition of, 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 slave, uh, of the slave trade, both of them, they ended up opposing slavery, but they accepted indentured servitude as a substitute for slave labor in the British colonies. And indeed, if you look at all post-emancipation societies, you will not see a single one that instituted a regime of labor that's, that corresponds to anything that we would call free labor today. They all, yeah, they abolished slavery, and that was, that was taken in itself a tremendous advance, but they did not abolish forced labor. Um, it took, in fact, just a lot more struggle, even just against a million different forms of forced labor. And so that's why I think it's characteristic of the slow and halting manner in which human societies manage to achieve moral progress that uh, it doesn't really happen overnight. <laughs> it's even when revolutions happen, <laughs> moral revolutions really take a much longer time. It, they're much more incremental uh, uh, than, than one might think. And so I want to close with a uh, reflection by John Stuart Mill, who I think had it right. Um, he said, the history of human improvement is the record of a struggle by which inch after inch of ground has been wrung from these maleficent powers and more and more of human life rescued from the iniquitous dominion 
of the law of might. Uh, that's pretty much even today uh, the situation that we are working with. But I hope that reflection on uh, the origins of the social movement and how uh, it has some epistemic power, at least when it speaks truth to power, uh, can help us think about mobilization for improvement today. Thank you. about whether uh, slavery is unjust or whether they ought to support uh, women's uh, equal or gender equality or something. You know, he was interested in, in mass change, not the sort of like uh, inner dialogue, chewing it over to yourself kind of question. But he, his argument was that if nothing changes in the social or demographic or political or economic circumstances of the world, the basic sanctions and affirmations people face in their for their behaviors, then absent that, uh, parents will mold their children in, uh, in, in the same way that they were molded. So he, he wouldn't expect any uh, ideological moral change to happen under those circumstances. He, 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 he argues that you're only going to see it happen when there's some kind of disjuncture in the either in you know, his term is affirmations and sanctions, or in the, the social economic kind of circumstances which people face, then moral change will, will uh, have an opening to sort of take hold. So his example is in the, in the post-war period, all of a sudden there was a massive demand for educated labor. Women started entering the workforce. This generated a kind of disjuncture which made for an opening for uh, ideological shifts to happen, which wouldn't have necessarily taken hold under other circumstances. But he puts all of the Right, on so, so yeah, so there is a really interesting question here about whether you need uh, some kind of material change in the world in order to get the ball rolling in the first place. And one thing that I didn't discuss in this talk is, well, where do these British abolitionists get their moral ideas from? Yeah. What was happening? Well, you know, That's a really, really great question, and I actually am not prepared to discount wholly uh, the idea of ideological change having independent force. Um, but there were material changes at the same time. If you look at the origins of abolitionism in the British case, uh, it really started with the Quakers. Um, and the Quakers, you know, if you go back to the mid-17th century when they arose, uh, there were, in fact, pretty dramatic material changes in society were happening at the time that, in which uh, large classes of people um, found themselves uh, without superiors who were in a position to, like, order them around. And uh, the Quakers uh, were among those who were pretty rebellious against established authority, and particularly the authority of uh, the Church of England. Uh, uh, and so they're, they're busy during the uh, English Civil War setting up their own churches in defiance of the Church of England. Uh, and a lot of other people were doing the same thing. And of course, there's material background conditions for that that include things like the spread of literacy, the printing press, so people can now read the Bible for themselves and interpret it for themselves. But you know that's a, a one at the same time a material change and an uh, and an ideological change, right? Once people have that Bible, they're reading it and interpreting for themselves, and they're coming up with ideas of their own. And and that that kind of um, ideological change is then feeding directly into the abolitionist movement. So the Quakers, in fact, were the ideologues behind abolition. Although the public face of abolition was evangelical Christian, because the Quakers. Uh, 
were considered rather disreputable <laughs> in England at the time. But it, in fact, the Quakers having had a lot of organization ability because they had spent decades uh, fighting for their own rights to run independent churches. So they had enormous amounts of, uh, you know, they had networks and chapters of Quakers. They've been used to petitioning parliament and so forth. They had a lot of skills that then fed into the abolitionist movement, although the public face was carried by evangelicals within the Church of England. Now you can also ask, well, why did the evangelicals decide to take up uh, 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 abolition as a cause? And again, you know, there's a combination of material and ideological circumstances here. But one, I think, very important feature of the ideological landscape is um, within evangelism, uh, uh, the rise of the higher valorization given to sympathy and sentiment. Uh, uh, I think is actually quite important. So the British abolitionists in particular stress the cruelty of slavery and the slave trade and that, that cultivation of a sense of sympathy uh, uh, for others I think was really critical in, in, in mobilizing. So that's not just ideology because in fact it's, it, there's an affective transformation here, a transformation of, of feelings, of habits of feeling were, were, were quite critical. <laughs> and at the same time, too, um, really profound challenges. This is sort of running me a little bit astray, but there were deep challenges that were also happening towards the very idea of original sin. The idea that uh, uh, we were, that human beings were inherently subject, they're just inveterate sinners. Uh, uh, the Quakers were definite opponents of the ideology of original sin, and the whole idea of being born again is a way of, of conceiving oneself as being delivered from sin. Now, what makes that important is the single most important argument in favor of slavery, justifying slavery in the Christian tradition from Augustine on was based on original sin. What do you need slavery for? Well, because everyone needs a master to whip them into obedience. Because if you just let them loose free under their own recognizance, they're, they're, they're all going to be sinners. Better to be a slave to a master than a slave to sin. That was a traditional Christian argument. And that lasted just centuries. And so any kind of critique of the doctrine of original sin, any thought that human beings of themselves could be capable through an inner transformation of heart to overcome original sin was an incredibly radical doctrine because it potentially threatened all authority. And indeed, that's where the Quakers took it in the mid-17th century. And that's one of the reasons why left-wing movements in Christian countries historically have been associated with millenarianism, right? Because what, what, you know, the imminent arrival of Jesus is a sign that we're all going to be redeemed. Right? No more sin. <laughs> what do we need authority for? So, right, so there's a combination, I want to say, of material and ideological changes that seed the ground for social movements. Then, of course, you know, I haven't talked about this because I wanted to leave time for Q&A, but there were also changes that were happening in the slave colonies themselves that were largely propelled by the contention of slaves. So even at the height of profitability, one of the most interesting things we found about, about abolition in the New World was that the slave systems in every country were destroyed at their absolute peak of profitability. Slave owners were making mountains of money. However, these systems were also exposed as being very unstable. In San Domingue, in Jamaica, you had slave revolts. People were getting really jittery because <laughs> the slaves didn't want to put up with it. Uh, uh, and so 
a feeling that even though they're making money hand over fist, that the system maybe is hanging by a thread, I think also helped uh, jar the powers you know, that we're upholding the slave system into thinking, well, you know, maybe we have to rethink this whole system because <laughs> it might not last. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, because you said you mentioned you didn't have time to get to the next part, which was about uh, slaves and violence. And I, I thought to myself that um, it, would, it would seem antithetical to any social movement to use violence as a means of trying to disrupt norms because it would seem that it would be antithetical to um, the first point of Tilly's definition of the social uh, movements, which is worthiness. Because um, it appeared to me that if you were using violence, that it almost like discredit yourself as a worthy agent to hold moral yeah. authority over somebody. Right, that's a really great point. And so what you have to do is you have to look in more detail at the history to see how slaves were working against that. So in particular, in, in the case of Saint-Domingue, what was critical was um, there was already, a, not only was there a slave revolt going on, but there was also high degrees of contention between um, free blacks, free colored, they called them, and whites over uh, the race line. So <coughs> with the free colored population in uh, uh, the French colony of Saint-Domingue were demanding was uh, equal rights. You know, it all happened during the French Revolution, right? We're free, so we're entitled to the same rights as any other citizen. So there was already a lot of contention over that happening on the island. And uh, in the revolt, essentially what happened is both Spain and England sent ships over because they thought we could just pluck off this colony for ourselves. And at that point, with the majority of the population being slave, all sides are trying to get slaves on their side in order to fend off the Spanish and the British. Uh, and so then they needed the slaves. They're forced into a bargaining position. Right? And essentially, they realized that the only way to get slaves to rally on their side is fight for the republic. Uh, uh, was uh, to offer them freedom. So this is a case where, although the slave revolt originated, uh, uh, you could say, as an assault on the, the law and authority of France, it didn't end up that way in the end, cause <laughs> because France needed uh, uh, the slaves to, to they fend it off the British, they fended off the Spanish, and it was the slave owners who actually joined the British. Because the British promised them, we'll reestablish slavery for you, but then they became traitors. So the slaves proved their patriotism. And a very similar dynamic happened in the United States during the Civil War. Right? As the Union armies advance across the Confederate States, slaves escape behind Union lines. Uh, and, uh, you know, they join, eventually are allowed to join the, the, the Union Army. And so here they are, they're staking their claims as patriots, right? They're fighting for the Union, and indeed they play a critical role towards, towards the end of the Civil War in a, achieving victory for the Union. So again, it's not violence as such, but violence that's backed up with a claim of patriotism or some kind of valor that commands admiration uh, 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 that, that has, I think, epistemic power to help move people past their, their in this case, racist biases. But I, I agree with you, it's always a double-edged sword because you know, the other side of it is people in panic that you know, in Haiti, um, Blacks going on a rampage and you know killing a lot of white people that, that created huge racial panic not just the course in Haiti but all, all across the South. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's, so the use of violence does have this. It's it's much more dangerous for that reason in terms of whether you're going to jar a positive recognition or a moral panic on the other side. 
Do you have a question? I, I did. It was sort of related. I, 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 um, I really love this talk, but I, but I am a little confused about, or confused, or I think in using the sociology, it, the philosophical argument is backed up by a s very selective use of social movements. It, I had this argument with Chuck Tilly also. Yeah. <laughs> that in the politics of contention, yeah. the, the social movements that they focus on um, are almost entirely peaceful. And they overlook the very frequent use of violence in social movements that actually, in places where violence is really legitimized and supported by people. So even in the Indian nationalist movement, Gandhi was nonviolent, but there was a strong wing of it that wasn't nonviolent and was very legitimated by people in India. And I, I've always thought that Tilly, in his focus on the more peaceful means of disruptions, avoided it, looking at the places where violence gets legitimated. And if you're going to make your social movements part of the normative shift that, that it, and say you're going to be able to somehow show it's progressive, it seems to me somehow you also need some logic to say under what circumstances that kind of violence is legitimate or yeah. justified. Now, this is really excellent. So, so let, me just, let me just situate this talk in the larger project, project that I'm I'm sorry, <laughs> what is that? Chuck Tilly hated me for... <laughs> no, I think actually you're right on point. So let me just situate this talk in the larger project that I'm working on. So I'm, I'm using, I'm, I'm thinking about all the different methods for contending uh, uh, slavery that were used. Um, and, I'm, I, and I'm working on a book that's basically going to be reflecting on all of these methods and, look, and considering from a pragmatist point of view can we detect uh, uh, features of these movements that have some kind of progressive epistemic power? So I'm not at all ruling out. I mean, I think, as I, as I just said in answer to my last question, sometimes violence does have power, have, have positive epistemic power. It's not just that it, that it succeeds in the world in whatever its aims it gave itself, but that we can have reason to think that maybe the way it achieved its success improved people's, in some cases, it can bring about moral clarity. And, and so I'm, I, I'm with you here. But in some cases, it doesn't. And, and so I'm also interested in thinking, can, can we, at a higher level of abstraction, try to figure out under what circumstances different modes of contention might be productive or not? of moral progress. That's my more general thing. So I don't want to say that social movements are the exclusive vehicle by any means. I just That's just like one of my case studies. I'm looking at violence. I'm looking at litigation. I'm looking at all kinds of different modes of contention and, and seeing whether we can say anything useful from an epistemic point of view, because all of this is very contingent. So you have to look at the circumstances in which these modes of contention were mobilized. Are they operating against systematic moral biases or perhaps triggering those biases? Or you have to look in detail at the cases to see what's really going on. Um, I'm inclined to think that uh, eliminating slavery was moral progress because of <laughs> certain kinds of moral arguments that I would make. I think it's very difficult to make good moral arguments uh, in defense of slavery. And I'm worried that the pragmatist account in effect, is going to uh, see ep moral epistemic progress in any widespread successful social movement. So if you think about pro-life movement in the United States, which has adopted all the various things showing their worthiness under the cloak of re religion and the like, it seems to me if they wind up successfully overturning Roe versus Wade and getting rid of, a, uh, of abortion, uh, I worry that on your criteria we're going to wind up uh, seeing this as real moral progress, and I don't think it would be moral progress at all because of a variety of arguments I accept, not because of what actually winds up working, as it were. Yeah, so uh, just want to, uh, I, I, in the course of doing my research, I actually read thousands of pages of pro-slavery argument. <laughs> I had to read the other side to see, like, how are they thinking? And while they're like completely drenched with delusions, um, so uh, pro-slavery argument reached its peak in the United States just before the Civil War. Uh, the British pro-slavery people just were like completely out to lunch. I mean, in their argument be be 
before Parliament, they can barely muster anything remotely resembling a moral argument. It's like, think of the empire, think of all the profits lost. <laughs> so you couldn't really muster a moral argument. But, but the Americans actually had quite a long time, and they're writing these long treatises. That, and I have to say, you know, remember, from a pragmatist point of view, we start with where people are, not from our current point of view. And they had some pretty powerful arguments relative to the moral beliefs at the time. By far the strongest suit for the pro-slavery argument came from the Bible. The truth is the Bible has tons and tons of support for slavery. And the pro-slavery people were very close and learned readers of the Bible. And they, they amassed a huge amount of evidence. So, so and remember virtually everybody at the time was a Christian. They believed in biblical morality. If you're starting there, Wow, there's a lot you can say in favor of slavery. So I just want to set this up, but let, let's look at the contemporary thing. So this is why I had that slide in which I say, look, the epistemic power of a social movement is completely contingent. It's not merely the fact it's mobilizing a lot of people in favor of something. On my view, the causal account of why it's progressive is when it speaks truth to power. Okay, and if it's not doing that, um, that, then you don't have any particular reason to believe that it's going to uh, uh, produce an improvement in moral belief. So one thing we do know about <clears throat> the pro-life movement in the United States is that it has no compunctions whatsoever about lying. It just doesn't. They set up these crisis pregnancy centers in which they lie continuously to to women uh, who don't know, you know who these people are. They've passed laws requiring doctors to lie to their patients about the health risks of abortion. They lie about how contraception works, misrepresenting it as an abortifactant. They lie about the capacity of fetuses to feel pain even before the neurons have developed that connect the extremities to pain centers in the brain. Okay, there's just so much lying going on. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> it's not speaking truth. And it's not speaking to the powerful either. We're talking about a movement that's ensnaring desperate women in very vulnerable positions uh, uh, to trick and trap them into a life course that is not their choice. Um, so I, I actually think the pro-life movement, while it is a social movement, is not speaking truth to power. And consequently, we don't have any reason to think that the way it mobilizes uh, 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 support is, is morally progressive. Now, of course, that does mean that we do have to, you know, we do have to look at the arguments. So I, I'm not saying that the arguments don't matter. Uh, moral arguments matter. I mean, a lot of what happens when, when a social movement disrupts routine, the point of it is, is to jar people into practical reflection, right? And once they engage in practical reflection, moral arguments play a role. I mean, other arguments play a role too, but <clears throat> moral arguments are among the arguments that play a role. My point is, is that pure moral argument, in the absence of any felt need to actually deliberate, is just speculation. And it doesn't really move people. We could argue over the seminar table and like come to a conclusion that something radically ought to change. But that's just speculative unless we're actually forced to change the way we carry on our lives and, have, and are shown a clear pathway, both that we need to change and a path out of our, our, our current habits. Then, then we're engaged in practical liberation. Otherwise, it's, you know, and, and I'm not saying moral speculation is is bad. Sometimes, you know, occasionally that does move people, but it doesn't move whole societies.
Um, I'm just wondering about the epistemic part, what the truth here is. I take it on a pragmatic view, the truth is something like uh, the optimal norms to solve the coordination operation problem. And I'm just wondering if that's con a contingent solution or is there a necessary solution? So I could see yes. it being a contingent solution that changes over time depending on the material conditions, demographics, all sorts of other factors. Um, but I worry there that then the, the target keeps changing, right? Yes, so we right, get to it does, actually. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the crude pragmatist formula is whatever works, but of course then what's the standard of working, right? And so we had to get more precise and articulate about what we mean. And so the thought is that um, <coughs> any given moral norm, you can ask, like, what is its point? What, what is it trying to do for us? Okay, and by and large, in here we're thinking about morality in terms of what we owe to each other, those kinds of moral norms. So I'm not talking about norms that, about like the good life. I'm just, I'm talking just specifically about norms whose whole point is the regulation of interpersonal claims. Who owes what to who, who what, where, how to distribute our duties, our responsibilities, and so forth. Um, and, and so we can ask of any moral norm, you know, what is it, you know, what, what social problem is it trying to solve, okay? And then we can ask, well, is it, is it, is it doing a good job solving that problem? Does it have, like, really bad side effects? Could we think of alternatives? Now, it's quite possible that in the course, and this is going to be one of the themes I have for, for, for my second lecture, that in the course of testing out alternative ways of, coordinating expectations and, you know, hammering out norms of cooperation and so forth, that our understanding of uh, what we're trying to achieve could change. And typically it does because, uh, you know, we have this great idea, what we think is a great idea about, you know, say how to organize production. Um, and then it has all kinds of unanticipated consequences. And so we have to kind of, right, revise our understandings of really what we want. And maybe, oh yeah, so we want to, you know, achieve production, but without certain bad consequences, say. Or, you know what I mean, or in the course of, of testing out a certain norm, we might, we might realize that certain things are possible that we didn't think were possible before. And that could also change the goal that, that, that we want our, our, our norm to solve. And so in these ways, right, morality ends up being a constantly shifting target. Uh, uh, it, it's so, so yeah, so it's quite possible from a pragmatist point of view that you could have, say, path-dependent moral change, where we could say where claims of progress are only relative to a given society or a different co di a particular context. And we might be able to say for any two points rather close, causally close, we could say that A is better than B or is, represents an improvement over B, but for radically different uh, practices and societies or maybe the same society but at radically different point of time, points in time, maybe we run out of the, the ability to say anything interesting, comparatively speaking. One more question, probably, at most. Yeah. Um, I had the impression that the moral bias that is the most problematic is not the bias of the powerful, but the bias of the powerless. By this, I mean that the most disadvantaged people come often to endorse the beliefs of the powerful and to accept their condition. And I was wondering what could social movements do for that? They should have like an educational function. And I would like to know how you would address this issue. And it seems to me that it's much more important than to address the authorities. That's yeah, so it is actually a really interesting question to what extent do subordinates kind of internalize their own subordination. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, with respect to, to slavery in the new world, certainly by the, by the time we get to um, the 18th century, 
I don't think we see very good evidence that the slaves are sort of content with their lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, there, there's, we have very richly documented evidence of lots and lots of revolts, even on the ships taking them over. But still, even having said that, um, it's an interesting question. Did, did they accept slavery in Africa? Because a lot of the people who were brought over were already enslaved in Africa. Not all of them, but a good number of them were. And we do have some contemporary evidence that, um, that, that certain attitudes of subordination can, can be and have been internalized. And so then, yeah, absolutely. Then, then you know, you need techniques for uh, uh, dealing with that. And, and such techniques have been developed. So a classic case is uh, feminist consciousness raising, the feminist movement, um, right? So and, and that's, it's kind of a, an aspect of any kind of critical theory where you, you kind of get people to reflect on discontents in their lives and then offer a diagnosis that it amounts to a critique of the system they're in rather than, say, self-blame or something like that, right? It's, it's directing people's consciousness to the uh, uh, structural causes of their discontent. So tomorrow we have another opportunity, 8417 Social Science across the street. Thank you very much. <laughs>